Hello there, this is Dr. DeMaio, and we're going to be talking about joints today. The purpose of this chapter is to introduce various types of joints in the body, discuss how these joints are classified, and learn the types of movements. This is right out of your Tartora book, Chapter 9. So what is a joint? A joint is a point of contact between two or more bones, and uh, you can have different types of joints. It's usually associated with some cartilage and bone. And you can even have joints with uh, teeth and bones. So you can have two or more bones coming together without cartilage. You can have bone on bone, like in a suture, which is a very tight joint. And you can have bones that have cartilage in between. At the end of every long bone, there's a bit of hyaline cartilage, but then some uh, joints have an actual fibrocartilage disc, as we talked about with the spine, and even on the ulna. And even your TMJ has a little disc. Uh, the teeth and the bone are also a joint. Too. So joints can be classified, classified, excuse me, as structural classifications or a functional classification. Structurally, uh, we talk about: is there any space between the joint? How much of a joint space or joint cavity is there? What type of connected connections does it have? Is it connected by fibrous, cartilage, or bone to bone. And how about the function? You could do structural, structural, structural classification or functional classification. What degree of movement? Is it freely movable, partially movable, or immovable? Uh, we can't, this is a view, you can watch this on the video about joints, it's an overview. So when we talk about structural classification of joints, they're either uh, structured with a fibrous joint, a cartilaginous joint, or what's called a synovial joint. Now the synovial joint has a synovial cavity. Let's talk about fibrous joints. Uh, sutures of your skull are considered to be a fibrous joint. They have dense fibrous connective tissue. A syndesmosis is more dense fibrous connective tissue than a suture, and that would be like your teeth, the gomphosis joint of your teeth. And then interosseous membranes, a broad sheet of dense fibrous connective tissue between examples would be like the radius and the ulna, the tibia and the fibula. Or they can be classified as cartilaginous joints and you can have synchondrosis or symphysis. A synchondrosis has hyaline cartilage, but there's no movement. And this would be like the growth plates, the epiphyseal plates. A symphysis is like a fibrocartilage disc in between, there's some movement, and we see this in the pubic symphysis. Whereas a synovial joint, there's articular cartilage at the end of the long bone, and also other bones, and uh, between articulating bones surrounded by accessory ligaments. It's usually freely movable too. But we're talking about a structural classification here. We're not talking about the uh, functional, right? So one of the things that you find is that when you look at this type of joint, a uh, synovial joint, it usually has an articular cartilage on the end of the long bone. And then there's a cavity in between. It gives you space. If you have space between the two bones, you can have more movement, right? And then the ligaments are, are there are accessory ligaments associated and it's usually freely movable. Hip, knee, shoulder, elbow. Now when we talk about functional classification, we're talking about how it moves. Sin comes together, arthrosis, very close, very little movement. The two bones are closely knit together. Examples of sutures and the gonfosis classified as having no movement. However, the teeth do give, and the sutures do give a little bit. Not much, but very slightly. When you're chewing, uh, the teeth are, have a ligament, and it actually can allow the teeth to move a little bit instead of cracking right away. Amphiarthrosis versus diarthrosis. Okay, amphiarthrosis means little movement. Uh, diarthrosis means freely movable. Uh, the pubic symphysis is limited movement, intervertebral disc between the vertebral body is limited movement, and then the hip and knee, shoulder and elbow are diathroneal joints. 
which by the way the vertebral spine has some diathroidal joints the atlas and the occiput and the atlas and the axis are diathroidal. I'm going to show you a video from a dissection uh, seminar that I go to every two years where they actually show the atlas moving and the skull moving on it in a dissection not for the faint-hearted so if you don't want to watch that video just close your eyes or don't watch it fibrous joints they lack synovial cavity a fibrous joints lacks a synovial cavity this is not a diathroidal joint usually uh, so the articulating bones are held together with dense fibrous connective tissue there's very little movement sometimes no so suture syndesmosis and the interosseous membranes are considered to be fibrous joints an example here it is suture like the coronal suture you have uh, a ligament holding it together the um, syndesmosis between the tibia and the fibula very little movement it gives remember we talked about closed pack it has to give a little bit down here and up here it moves a little so structural and functional classification of fibrous joints a suture syndesmosis into osseous membrane a suture is articulating bones united by a thin layer dense irregular connective tissue found between the skull bones with age some of them get replaced completely with bone they fuse its functional classification of a suture is that it is sin arthrosis immovable sometimes they're slightly movable uh, the coronal suture is one a syndesmosis is an articulating bone reunited by more dense connective tissue an example would be the distal tibiofibular joint and that's considered to be amphiarthrosis slightly movable an interosseous membrane articulating bones together are it allows for slight movement amphiarthrosis an example again is between the tibia and the fibula so when you saw that example distal tibia and fibula is more movable than between the middle part right cartilaginous joints they lack a synovial cavity the bones are held together with cartilage connective tissue permit little or no movement and the types of cartilaginous joints include a synchondrosis and a symphysis you can watch the animation on your own version so here's some example of cartilaginous joints here's them here's the sternum right here and the sternum has a cartilaginous joint between the ribs first second third fourth all the way down to let's see one two three four five six seven seven and right here this is all cartilaginous joints here between the sternum and that and then the pubic symphysis is a symphysis so the cartilaginous joints are considered to be synchondrosis where the pubic symphysis is a symphysis type of joint and um, these are all types of um, joints associated with cartilage and so you can have epiphyseal growth plates they're epiphyseal cartilage right and this is actually the growth plate so these are all examples of cartilaginous joints so again structural and functional classification of cartilaginous joints you have synchondrosis symphysis and ep epiphyseal uh, synchondrosis the connection is hyaline cartilage and it's amphiarthrotic slightly movable and some are synarthrotic they don't move between the first rib and the manubrium of the sternum is a good example a symphysis is connecting material a broad flat disc to the fibrocartilage. cartilage that is slightly movable especially in women it's a little more movable when they deliver a baby it starts to loosen up and the intervertebral disc joints this is at the disc we're not talking about the facets when we talk intervertebral so this is actually between the vertebral bodies and the cartilage right so that's considered to be slightly movable an epiphyseal cartilage would be the growth plates and it's the hyaline in between the growing bones it's not actually a joint see not actually a joint it's considered to be immovable uh, the epiphyseal plate between the diaphysis and the epiphysis of a long bone is an example now if you have a shift in that plate 
in orthopedics they call that a subluxation which is really a fracture through the growth plate if it shifts completely out of place synovial joints have a synovial cavity these are the freely movable bones there's a big space a cavity the articulating bones are covered with articular cartilage that's the hyaline cartilage at the end of each bone or facets they're held together by ligaments they contain synovial fluid in those joint spaces in the actual cavity is synovial fluid they do have an excellent nerve supply and blood supply and are surrounded by an articular capsule which would be like a ligament it's really not a ligament it's actually called a capsule of ligament right and it permits a large range of movement freely movable good example here's a finger so here's a frontal plane view of the uh, distal interphalangeal joint right here the dip this would be the middle phalange going up proximal phalange would be over here middle phalange here and this is the distal phalange and then what you're seeing here you see a, a space this is the synovial cavity contains the synovial fluid right there and then this is the capsule surrounding it a fibrous membrane and you see how it inserting into the periosteum and this fluid the synovial fluid has a thixotropic nature thix o tropic what does that mean thixotropic it means it does not follow Newtonian physics it, it can the actual fluid can respond in a different way depending on the forces that are applied to it because in Newtonian physics every action um, responds every action has an equal and opposite reaction that's Newtonian physics you know you put one uh, force one way it goes the other way it's going to have an equal equal and opposite however when the synovial fluid is suddenly accelerated it becomes thinner it loses um, it, its viscosity becomes more thin so the fluid instead of being thick it's nice like a gooey thick material like syrupy type uh, fluid it has a nature like ketchup ketchup has the same thixotropic nature that if you suddenly accelerate it goes from thick to thin instantaneously and that's why sometimes you can have a shearing force and a sudden impact and this bone can shear and go to the left or right much easier than if it was a slow pressure put on it because the fluid becomes thinner and allows us to slide faster that's one reason why uh, even though it's a five mile an hour car accident a person can herniate a disc because of the shearing force of the vertebrae going left to right or forward and back because the synovial fluid was suddenly accelerated and decelerated and it became very uh, thin or it's um, uh, it, was, it was its coefficient was reduced so you could slide much easier so you have these things called bursa and tendinous sheets a bursa and a tendinous sheet can be found at many synovial joints a bursa is a sac like structure filled with synovial fluid it helps to cushion the movement of one body part over another so kind of like uh, also it could be a, um, a, like a cushion between a tendon or a ligament and allowing pressure over it without damaging it then you have something called the tendinous sheath or tendon sheath is kind of like a, you ever see the Chinese handcuffs these little thing you put on your finger finger cuffs you know wraps and you pull and it becomes tighter it kind of looks like that a tube like bursa that wraps around the tendons and it's subject to a great deal of friction you'll probably see a lot of these cases in the future where a person has pain in their thumb when they bend their thumb down like tries to oppose your thumb towards the pinky it really hurts in the joint right by where we did the um anatomical snuff box the tendon in there has a tendon of the sheet and it becomes inflamed and the diagnosis is tenosynovitis t-e-n-o-s-y-n-o 
V-I-T-I-T-S, which is inflammation of the tendinous sheath. It can happen in the biceps too. It can happen in many different areas wherever there's a tendinous sheath. Um, let's talk about the types of movement of joints. You can have a joint that just glides upon each other, and you see how the carpals have this gliding movement. And we talk about angular movements, which has to do with what we went over the flexion, extension. This is, see, they're calling in anatomy, they call this neutral position extension of the head. But in clinical practice, this is neutral. And then when you go backwards, it's called extension. And when you go forwards, it's called flexion. So clinically, we use extension for hyperextension and neutral for this extension position. Flexion is when you're bringing the body parts towards each other. See how the elbow's going towards you? So that's flexion and opening up is extension. Bringing your shoulder up, your arm up at the shoulder joint, that's flexion. And coming back down is all extension. And then they're calling this hyperextension and anatomy. But we call this neutral and that's extension. And then flexion of the wrist, of course, coming towards the body part. Extension, they're calling neutral extension. And then they're calling this hyperextension. For our class, we're going to call neutral and extension, neutral and extension, neutral and extension. We're not going to use the term hyperextension because we have to start prepare for our clinicals. So this would be neutral right here, right? and they're calling it, they're never really calling it extension until you're bringing the foot towards that. And then this is flexion going up, this flexion of the hip, extension of the hip going back, extension of the knee going up, and flexion going this way. Lateral flexion to the side, that would be right, that would be left lateral flexion. And we can have uh, abduction, bringing the arms away from the body, that's abduction. Bringing it towards the body is adduction. Bringing the legs away is abduction. Bringing it towards the body is adduction. Now this is the lateral side. Let's erase all this for a second. Let's look at this. So this is the lateral side, correct? So when you bring, this is the midline over here, right? And so when you're bringing the wrist away from the body, that's called abduction, right? Away from the body is abduction. And bringing it back towards this side is adduction. Now the fingers, the middle fingers in the center here, so the fingers going away is abduction each, so each way, because this would be the midline for the hand. So let me just erase this for a second. Wait. So this is actually trying to look at the hand. This one is looking at the hand. And so here's a wrist. And so this thumb is moving away. That's moving away from the midline. And that's moving away from the midline too. So when it comes to the hand, this is your midline. So anything away from it is an abduction of the digits. And when you bring them towards the midline, it's called a deduction. But the wrist, here's the lateral side. Here's the uh, medial side of the body. So the human body would be right here, right? And so when you bring the hand away, that's called a deduction. Another name we called it was, what's another name for wrist a deduction? That's called radial deviation. And a deduction is moving towards the ulnar side. So that's also called ulnar deviation. Circumduction is a combination of all those movements, like a, making a circle. And rotation, you're rotating on the mid axis, right down the central axis, uh, or the Y of the body, right? And so you're rotating to the right, that's right rotation. Rotation to the left, that's left rotation. The shoulder, you can call this medial rotation or internal rotation. And going outward is called lateral rotation or external rotation. Same thing with the hip, you could do the same thing. Laterally rotate or externally rotate 
or medially rotate or internal rotation. So we can have some special movements of the TMJ, um, bringing the teeth clenched tight, that's elevation, and depression is dropping the jaw. You can protract the jaw forward like, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Dudley do, right? Oh, no. And his chin goes really far off the forward. And retraction is bringing it straight back. So you can jut your jaw forward like someone's pulling out a tape measure. You jut the jut lower jaw forward. That's protraction, just like if you protracted out a tape measure. And you can press the button on the tape measure, and it slides back in. It's retracting. So the jaw coming back in is retraction. In the foot, this is a left foot right here, okay? All right, so this is a left foot. And so bringing it up towards the midline is inversion and out and away and up towards the top is eversion. And this is the foot going up into dorsiflexion. This is it going down into plantar flexion. We did this in class the other day. It's good now you have it all on paper. Now the palm is anterior this view, right? So when you turn the palm outward, it's like serving the soup. If you were to serve soup, you'd have to hold your hand outward like that. And then if you flapped your hand straight down, that's pronation. Just like if you're laying face down, that's the prone position. If you lay in your back, that's the supine position. And then opposition is just bringing the pinky and thumb together. That's what opposition is here. Okay. So movements of the synovial joints, you, have, you can have gliding joints. They glide forward, back, left, right, and the carpal bones are very commonly doing that. And then, um, uh, angular movements have to do with flexion, lateral flexion, extension, uh, hyperextension, which we call extension really, abduction, adduction, and circumduction is a combination of all the above. Rotation is turning on a central axis, left or right, and so you can have rotation of the, every part of your spine basically. Lumbar spine doesn't do much rotation but you can also rotate the head and neck. You can rotate the thoracic spine. You can rotate your shoulders. You can rotate your, your hips as well. And then special movements such as elevation of the jaw, depression of the jaw, protracting the jaw forward, and not just the jaw, you can do protraction, elevation, and depression of the scapula too. Also retraction, so these are all these can be associated with scapular movements, which is very important for you guys. We'll go over all that stuff when we get to it. Inversion is with the foot, eversion out, inversion in, dorsiflexion, toes up, plantar flexion, toes down, supination with the forearm is serving the soup, turning your thumb outward, pronation is slapping it down on the table, and opposition is bringing your pinky and thumb together. Structural and functional classification of synovial joints continued. Uh, the summary of functional classification is it's characterized by the synovial, we're talking about synovial joints here, characterized by having a space or synovial cavity. They also will have articular cartilage on the ends of each bone, and sometimes you'll see bursa. You'll also see a joint capsule. It may contain some accessory ligaments and even articular discs. Um, the plane of movement, hinge movement, and pivot. So plane uh, classific, a plane synovial joints, articulated surface flat and slightly curved. Uh, now we have this thing called biaxial diarthrodial movement. That means that it can move on two different axes and it's freely movable back and forth and side to side. Some joints have triaxial movement so it's back and forth, side to side, and rotates as well. Okay, so an example of plane type movements would be intercarpals, the intertarsals, the sternocostala, um, 
and the vertebral costal joints. A hinge joint has a convex surface fitting into a concave surface like the elbow, and it's usually uniaxial, one movement. Uh, and the, a good example would be the knee, actually, because it only has that one movement, the elbow, ankle, and interphalangeal joints. A pivot joint is rounded or pointed surface fitting into a ring, and partly by bone, partly by ligament, and it's a uniaxial diathroidal rotation, and that's like the elantoaxial and the radial ulnar joints. You can watch this animation with your with your own um, uh, lecture book if you have the digital content. Um, types of movement of synovial joints. Again, here's showing an example of the plane joint between the navicular and the second and third cuneiforms. And they can it's biaxial. It's sliding on two angles. You can go forward and back and right and left. If it's triaxial, it allows some rotation too. So this is a forward and back slide, a left and right slide, and then a rotation. That means it's a triaxial. This, these two sliding forward and back is biaxial, forward and back, left and right. So a hinge joint between the trochlea and the humerus that we learned about, uh, a trochlear notch of the ulnar and the elbow, and it's simply a uniaxial movement, just allowing it to flex like that and extend. But there's a rotational joint between the radius and the ulna here, and this is a pivot joint. That one movement is uniaxial, right? It's a rotation. Condyloid joint between radius and scaphoid and lunate bones. This is actually a synovial joint, allows for movement, and it's biaxial. It can move forward, uh, up this way, and this way for up and down and left and right. A saddle joint between the trapezium of the carpus and the wrist and the metacarpal of the thumb is a little more complex because the thumb can do more movements, obviously, and it's biaxial because it can um, pivot this way and also pivot this way. And then the hip socket uh, ball and socket between the head of the femur, that's a triaxial. It can rotate and it can um, rotate, uh, sorry, slide this way and this way, up and down, forward and back, side to side, and rotate. <clears throat> Factors affecting contact and range of motion of a synovial joint. First of all, the shape of the joint is very important. Does it allow for that movement? We talked about the wrist. We said that ulnar deviation had greater movement than radial deviation because the shape of the bone and the amount of space we had there, plus there was a disc. So structure and shape of the articulating bones, the strength and tautness of the joint ligaments. We looked at the hip versus the shoulder. The, the femur head is deeply seated in a socket, whereas the shoulder, it's not. The arrangement and tension of the muscles the contact of soft parts, and even hormones in disuse can affect range of motion. Let's look at some selected joints of the body. So this is the temporal mandibular joint, TMJ. And you can see you have this bucket handle here, zygomatic arch, right? You have an articular capsule around the mandible within the uh, mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. And there's an articular capsule surrounding it. There's a lateral ligament here. And then there's a stylomandibular ligament right here. Those are the ligaments of the joint. Now, if you look, and this is a blowout part of view now, what they did was they cut the bone so that you can see inside the mouth. So you cut the mandible here, and you're cutting the uh, zygomatic arch. You're seeing inside how there's a sphenomandibular ligament here from the sphenoid bone. And then there's a stylo ligament here from the styloid process. Now, if you look at the actual TMJ joint, this is a sagittal section between the uh, TMJ joint. And what you're going to see here is you have a nice space here. And that's going to have synovial fluid in there. So there'll be all, this blue area would have all synovial fluid in there. 
and there would be a slight meniscus, a little articular disc. And so the disc is here with synovial fluid. Uh, let me just erase this for a second. And I actually had a cine, I think I told you guys, of a patient with a TMJ problem, and the meniscus pops out as they open the jaw. It's very common that people have problems with that. And so you're seeing an articular tubercle here. You're seeing the condylar process. This is the condylar process of the mandible. And then there's a uh, hyaline cartilage on the top of that. And then there's a fibrocartilage disc with synovial fluid. And there's a nice space that allows for movement. And here's the shoulder joint, a little more complex. And we're seeing the clavicle here. This is your clavicle coming to meet the acromium here. And there's a ligament between the clavicle and the acromion. It's called the acromioclavicular ligament. And then here's the coracoid process. That was the acromion process. And so there's a coracoacromial ligament. And then we have this conoid ligament between the clavicle and the coracoid process. Conoid. And then there's this trapezoid ligament here. Now, surrounding the suprascapular notch is a suprascapular transverse scapular ligament. Okay, now here, this is the long head, the tendon of the long head of the biceps going through, what's this place called in between? The intertubercular sulcus, right? And you can see it going through, and this is actually uh, a tendinous sheath right here. And they're not marking it, but this is a tendinous sheet that it's slipping through the center, kind of like those Chinese uh, finger uh, handcuffs, you know, and it's going in between it within this intertubercular sulcus. This is the greater tubercle. You can't see the lesser tubercles below that. But notice there's lots of tendons of muscles coming across and coming in. It, a lot of those muscles are cut. You can't see that. And so what you're seeing here, this is a subscapula bursa right here. And this is the subacromial bursa. And the coracohumeral ligament is coming in here. And you'll see that in between all this stuff would be the supraspinatus coming down. Supraspinatus would be coming in between that and being cushioned by that subacromial bursa. And this is where you can get entrapment syndromes, where this gets damaged over time and it gets calcifications and it causes an entrapment there. Here it is again. Here's that subacromial bursa right here. And then here's the tendon of the supraspinatus. I, I had said on top, it's actually below. So there's the tendon of the supraspinatus below that. And so it gets a little cushion in between. This is actually showing you the, uh, the labrum right here. Uh, this is called the glenohumeral ligaments around it, but then there's a labrum, and there's a, there's a labrum surrounding everything here. Okay, so this is the glenoid cavity. Um, this is the articular capsule, and then Here's the tendon of the long head of the biceps coming into that supraglenoid tubercle. This would be the tendon of the long head of the triceps coming in here. And you can see some muscles here coming around. This would be the infraspinatus muscle right here. And this right here is the tendon of the teres minor right there. Okay. And this is the tendon of the sub, this is the subscapularis muscle. And this would be the tendon of it. So there's three, four muscles of the rotator cup, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis, all surrounding this humerus, humeral head here. Again, we're seeing an actual cadaver photo here, and this is actually the deltoid muscle coming down, right? This is the supraspinatus muscle right here. This is the head of the humerus, right? And then 
this is showing you the glenoid labrum around surrounding the glenoid cavity it shows you a little bit of the synovial membrane it's hard to see it and then here is your subscapularis muscle and let's see what else we got here it's hard this this is your supraspinatus right here this is the clavicle all right, let's look over here. It's a little easy to see it on this chart right here. So here's the acromium of the scapula right there. This is the clavicle. Here's the subacromial bursa. And this would be the supraspinatus muscle going between there. And it's going to come down. It doesn't show you go all the way down. Here's the tendon of the long, uh, the biceps brachial long head coming up. And this shows you the fibrous membrane of the capsule. Uh, you see the synovial membrane and the glenoid labrum. Here's the articular cartilage of the humerus right here. And this is all part of the scapula here. Now we look at the elbow joint. And what you're seeing here, this is the radius, this is the ulna, this is the olecranon bursa, so that when you put your elbow down, it doesn't really press on the bone, it actually hits the bursa first, a little cushion. And there are several ligaments associated with the elbow. You have an annual ligament of the radius, the ulnar collateral ligament, and the radial collateral ligament. So let's look at one. This is a medial view. You're looking at it from the medial side. And you can see if it's medial, this is going to be your ulna, correct? So what you're seeing here is the ulnar collateral ligament going like that, crisscross, right? And there's an articular capsule. The annual ligament is wrapping around, and you can see it here, annual is wrapping around the radius. That's the annual ligament of the radius. And then you have an articular capsule, of course. You see it on this side as well. Okay. And then you can see a little bit of the interosseous membrane. Here's the biceps tendon coming down to insert at the radial tuberosity we talked about. Here's the hip. And this is showing you, this is going to be your greater trochanter here, your lesser trochanter here. And so we're looking at this from what view? This is an anterior view because you can barely see the trochanters. You don't see a crest, right? You see more of a line. On the back, you would see the intertrochanteric -tro crest here. This is the intertrochanteric line. And so you're going to have the iliofemoral ligament going from the ilium to the femur, right? You're going to have a pubofemoral ligament going from the pubis to the femur. And here is a tendon of the rectus femoris muscle. See how high it is? Rectus femoris muscle crosses the hip besides going all the way down and crossing the patella. Here's the membrane for that smooth obturator. You still have blood vessels and nerves passing through there. Okay. And this is looking at the hip from the posterior view here. And so what you can see here is the lesser trochanter. Here's the greater trochanter, and this would be the intertrochanteric crest. There's a ligament on the back from the ischium. So it's called the ischiofemoral ligament. And you can see a little bit of that iliofemoral ligament up top. And you can see a little bit of that rectus femoris muscle from the side view there. You do have a deeper socket in the acetabulum than you do in the shoulder. And you have, you do have um, a labrum as well. There is a labrum, acetabular labrum. And you can see that this thing called the zona orbicularis is a ligament. And you have the greater trochanter, lesser trochanter here. And boom, boom, boom. Ligament of the head of the femur. And what you're seeing, notice the way this is all spongy bone. Look how beautiful that spongy bone is there. And uh, 
what they used to do in CAT scans, they now they have these special machines that can do bone density without having to do it. They would take a little, they would take a CAT scan of the hip here and take a portion and blow it up, magnify it, and look at the trabecular pattern to see if you had loss of bone density. All right, so here's a knee joint. This is the lower portion, right? So this is your tibia, this is your fibula, and this is the end of the femur, and you have these condyles. This is the lateral condyle, this is the medial condyle, and you have a meniscus, a lateral meniscus, and you have a medial meniscus, which is made out of cartilage. You have a anterior cruciate ligament you can see here, and you can see a little bit of the posterior cruciate ligament there, and you have a lateral collateral or fibula collateral ligament and a medial collateral or a tibial collateral ligament. Okay, so I like the term lateral collateral ligament rather than fibula collateral and medial collateral ligament rather than tibia because it tells you more where it's at exactly. So now this is a superior view of the menisci and so you're looking at this from a this is a posterior side and this is the anterior side and you got a bird's eye view from above so here's the fibula laterally on the right and there's a fibula collateral ligament there's a lateral meniscus right here that's all cartilage a medial meniscus that's all cartilage and you can see the posterior cruciate ligament coming in this way and you have another ligament here called the transverse ligament of the knee and then you have your anterior cruciate ligament coming across this way and here's the patella ligament which uh, helps to attach the quadriceps into the tibial tuberosity which would be down a little bit right here is the side view of the knee and what you're seeing here is you can see this is the anterior side and this is the posterior side and you have this, you can see a portion of the lateral meniscus here and here. You can see uh, a bursa underneath the uh, patella or above, I'm sorry, super patella bursa. This is your patella or kneecap. And there's a pre patella bursa and an infra patella bursa cushioning things. And then you're going to have your articular cartilage of the knee at the femoral side and the tibial side and what else we got you can see all these muscles coming in these are the hamstrings coming down these are the sural group coming down the back okay looking at it from an anterior view superficially you see the kneecap or patella right here you can see this is lateral side so this is your lateral or fibular collateral ligament this is your medial or tibial collateral ligament. And you have this muscles here. This is the muscles of the quadricep. This is your vastus medialis. And this is your vastus lateralis here. Vastus intermedius, you can't see well. And there's a sub patella bursa here. And there's a little bit of fat pad in between there to cushion things. Infra patella fat pad. A retinaculum, let's talk about that for a second. A retinaculum is a like a ligamentous material that's not very strong, just kind of wraps around everything. So there's a, a medial retinaculum and a lateral retinaculum. And you see that in the wrist as well. Looking at it from the posterior deep view, you can see you have this arcuate popliteal ligament right here. You have the popliteus muscle cut right there. And you see a little bit of the semi-membranous membranosus muscle, a hamstring muscle uh, cut. And then you have a little bit the medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament. And there's an oblique popliteal ligament going across. And you have an articular capsule going around the whole thing. It's cut, right? And there's another muscle besides the popliteus. Let me just erase this for a second because it's a little messy here. You have this other, see so you have a popliteus muscle we talked about for a moment. Here's the popliteus muscle being cut right here, right? That's it. And then you have a plantaris muscle here. 
This is the plan terrace, which is going to come all the way down. And then you have the lateral head of the gastrocnemius right next to it. It's a calf muscle. So the plantaris follows all the way down with the gastrocnemius, but it's a very thin little muscle. And here's the medial head of the gastrocnemius. So you have a lateral head and a medial head of gastrocnemius coming down here. It would be coming down like that. You can see a little bit of the tendon of the adductor magnus muscle right here. Now, I know some of this is not really, um, you're like, wow, what is with all these ligaments? We didn't even learn these muscles. When you learn the muscles, this will come together a little better. Okay. Looking at the knee joint again, this is another view. Boy, they went crazy with these images of the knee joint, didn't they? And you can review this on your own. Okay, so you can see the ligaments, they're like the PCL, which is the posterior cruciate ligament. It crisscrosses, right? As we age, our joints tend to experience a decreased production of synovial fluid, a thinning of the articular cartilage, and a loss of ligaments length, length and flexibility. Arthroplasty is joint replacement and can be formed to counter some of those effects. Well, that's counter. It's completely changing everything. So this is an example of a hip replacement here. They're probably much newer now than this image. And they have a ball and socket type of thing fitting right in there. This shows you another type where they just take a piece. They don't take the whole thing off, right? They're not taking the whole, they're just cutting it down and they're replacing this femoral component. And they cut this and replace the tibial component. And you can see this is a x-ray showing the complete replacement there. Different types of um, joint conditions, rheumatism and arthritis. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a metabolic arthritis, as is Lyme disease. And um, you can also get sprain strain of your joints. And tenosynovitis we talked about. And even a dislocated mandible is common.